Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for tomorrow evening. Uh, that would be Saturday, June the 3rd, and we are going to be looking at it from a contrarian perspective. And actually, I hate to put it that way, uh, because that would imply that usually I approach it from a different perspective. But the reality is, is that this is the way I always approach any form of wagering, where whether that be wagering on sporting events, whether it be wagering on the stock market, which is where I made uh, most of my money. Um, my approach to uh, any form of, of, of prediction market where you have to pay a VIG um, or a transaction cost is very similar. The idea is that when you have millions of dollars and billions of dollars in some markets, being plowed into, you know, opinions, it is quite egotistical to believe that you have any edge that can overcome a, a significant transaction cost. Um, now, I'm not saying that you don't have that ability to have that edge, but I'm just saying that it's quite egotistical to presume that you have one. Um so you are left with these this decision to make, you know, either accept that all prices are efficient and just never bet, or try to figure out what what part of the price of the entity, whether it be a stock, whether it be a wagering uh, a wagering uh, possibility, what part of that or what part of that price is driven less by reality and more by kind of public bias or things of that nature. Um, and if you can get your, your, your mind wrapped around that and that type of analysis, you are going to be well on your way to being a successful wagerer, a successful anal you know, analyzer of wagers and things like that. Um, and I believe that this ability, the ability to gauge public psychology, the ability to separate BS from reality is much more valuable than your ability to either, you know, straight up analyze a stock, for example, or straight up analyze a, a, a football team, you know, or straight up analyze a fight. You know, if, if you can have a, your finger on the pulse of what the public believes and be able to wait what they believe versus what is, you know, on the, in the line. I think that skill transcends all knowledge of, of the underlying, you know, feel that you're wagering. on. So when we started doing this for MMA, um, I don't know if it's been a year, but it's been close. We've had a lot of success doing this. Now, I will tell you that even with this approach, I still can't promise you that that we're going to overcome the vig, you know, because it's quite a bit of it actually. Um, but we've done so, we've done well so far. And the other thing that's cool is that you know, listen, if you're going to be betting on sports, you're going to be betting on MMA or whatever. I mean, I, I am presuming that you're doing it primarily for entertainment. I mean, yes, I mean you, you'd obviously like to win. But you're doing it because you want to watch the fights and you want to have some fun and you want to have a sweat. You want to, you know, you have something going on. What's kind of cool also about this approach is you're almost always going to be on things that nobody else is on. So that when you, you know, are successful, you get to rub it into more people, which is obviously worth something. Um, and it's always a good thing to, to have in your pocket the idea that you're not being a square that you are not on the same stuff that all the Joe Q public is on. It, it makes you, it makes you feel better. And it really makes you sharper kind of in general to be that type of person. So with that said, let's uh, get into it. And, and most of the time we're going to be, well, I shouldn't say most of the time. Sometimes we're going to be playing straight fight, straight fights. Sometimes we're going to be playing props, but the rules are going to be the same that we are going to bet every single fight on the card. And these are the rules. I, again, I'm, I'm not saying it's the best money management tool in the world. Obviously, it isn't. But that's what we're doing. We're not good enough to say, okay, I'm going to pass this fight. And this fight is going to be one unit. This fight is going to be two units. 
we're going to actually just make sure that we bet every single fight on the card. We're not going to say, you know, one is better than the other. Um, and we're going to bet one unit on each, each fight. And I'm going to be betting every single thing that I kind of release here. And again, it's all going to be very contrarian. And for those of you who have not been on this podcast, you'll kind of see what I mean. You're essentially, what you're trying to do is gauge where the public is, what makes the most sense, what story is the easiest one to tell, and make sure you don't bet on that story. And it's the exact same thing with the stock market. I mean, if you have a company that CNBC is saying is, is a great growth potential, and then you have 75 analysts saying that it's got a tremendous balance sheet, great leadership, they have a product that's a leader in their space, I promise you it's a short. Okay. That's just kind of the way life works. I mean, if, if, I mean, if, if everything was so great, why is the price the way it is? Okay. Um, so we're trying to fade that we're trying to go the opposite way. And so what we're doing here is we're going to, I'm going to give you an idea of where the public is on all these fights. Cause I've, you know, I've been stewing over these things, you know, since, since they came out like a week ago and we're going to be trying to fade that. Okay. So right off the bat, you have Philippe Linz versus Maxime Grishin and you have two kind of sloppy heavyweights. And the idea is that Maxime Grishin is very, very low volume, okay? That he might be able to like kind of grind out a decision, but he's not very active. And essentially all of the finishing equity, not all of it, but most of it is in Philippe Linz. Not to mention the fact that Philippe Linz in his last fight came out in first round and just ran over some dude, okay? So he obviously has that finishing upside. So if you're going to bet anyone, you know, you play something with Philippe Linz kind of inside the distance. So what that means is that these are the things we are not going to do, okay? We're going to presume that any line that involves Philip Linz getting the finish is completely overvalued because it's reflecting the public perception. The one side of this that nobody is on is the Maxime Grishin inside the distance, okay? People are just presuming that all these fights are binary, that it's either one guy by one way or one guy by the other, and those two binary outcomes are the ones that you have to avoid, okay? So essentially, there are only two ways you can bet this fight, in my opinion. Number one, you can either bet Philippe Linz uh, by decision, right? Or Maxime Grishin inside the distance. So let's take a look at some of these lines and let's see what, what our choices are. So we have Philippe Linz inside uh, by decision would be plus 275. And let's take a look at Grisham inside the distance. So Grisham inside the distance, we're looking at the second chance here, is actually plus 250. So we could actually go either way and be a, have a good contrarian play. So we're really flipping a coin here between Grisham uh, inside the distance or Philippe Linz by decision. I don't think either people are playing either of those sides. So let's go with... Um, Philippe Linz by decision. Plus 275, it's a little bit better price. Now we're going to save them here. I don't know if it's going to let me bet them while I'm logged into Zoom, um, but uh, we are going to bet 180 per fight. Okay, moving on to the next one. We have Damon Blackshear versus Juan Lacerda. Now again, this is not a fight that you're getting a lot of um, consensus, but what you are getting is a decent amount of consensus on the Lacerda side. Um, you're not getting too much of how this fight is going to end, but what you are hearing is that Lacerda is from this, uh, this, this one gym that's, that's really hot right now. And, uh, so we're going to probably fade that side. The, the, the side we're probably going to play is the Demond Blackshear side. And what we're going to look for is some kind of finishing prop. Um, because you know what, plus one thirty. I mean, you're not getting up and watching this stupid fight for a plus 130. We got we to get you something a little bit better. So let's take a look at some of these Demon Blackshear inside the distance props. I have a feeling that you're going to get a pretty good um, line on either of, got, either of these guys by submission. So let's just take a look at this. You have Lucera by submission plus 240, but you have Demon Blackshear by submission is plus 1100. One thing that Zaman Blackshear can do is take somebody's back. So at plus 1,100, uh, that's that's good enough for me. So we're going to play Zaman Blackshear by submission at 180. Okay, uh, Elise Reed versus Jin Yu Fry. To me, this is extremely easy. You have Jin Yu Fry, who is 38 years old, completely, completely washed up, right? And in her last fight, she she basically, uh, against Vanessa Demopoulos, 
That was a terrible performance. And Vanessa Demopoulos came out and her last fight was terrible also. So the Jin Frey, she's been fighting terrible opponents. She's been fighting bad. She's older. And Elise Reed has just much, much better striking. And, and her win over Corey McKenna was kind of like a show-out performance. Not to mention the fact that if you poll the industry, I would say that, you know, probably 90% of the people that you poll have given you Elise Reed to win. And I actually am being very tame about that. I've I've watched a lot of different pick shows and whatever it is, and I haven't just seen a single person that takes Jin Frey. So you'd think that Jin Frey is like basically plus three to one on the money line, but but Jin Frey, it's almost a pickup. You know, Elise Reed is only minus 130. So if Elise Reed is only minus 130 and everybody's picking her, something is definitely up. So we are going to take Jin Frey plus the 110 for 180. I'm not so greedy. I don't know how she's going to finish it, but uh, we're going to play Jin Frey plus the dollar ten. It's such a stupid bet that it's just going to, it's just kind of forced to work. All right. Uh, Daniel Santos versus Johnny Munoz. All right. So there's a, quite a bit of, of, of recency bias in this one. You have Daniel Santos, and he, the nickname Willie Cat certainly makes him a little more popular also. And his last fight, he, despite him getting kind of uh, beat up in the first round, had a flash kick knockout. He just was all over his dude in his in the second. Did he make it to the third round? I'm not sure. But he was just awesome. And now he's fighting a guy who's probably low volume. And he's just kind of probably just show out here. So essentially, this is where the public is. So anything with Santos to win or anything with Santos certainly inside the distance is just not going to happen for me. The only thing that you can really bet here is, is something on the Munoz side. And it's just a question of where you want to go. I think that Munoz, just the money line, is probably good enough at plus 190. So we're going to go do that. Johnny Munoz plus the 190. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't really play it inside the distance because what will happen is if he finds that he can get takedowns, he can ride out a, a three-round three, three round decision and then you don't want to, you know, listen, you don't want to play a two to one underdog and, and and lose your bet just because you didn't, you know, finish the fight in the way that you wanted. Okay, so Andre Arlovsky versus Dante Mays. To me, this is extremely easy. This is what I've been hearing all throughout the industry is that despite the fact that Andre Arlovsky is 44 years old, this is a fight that's quote unquote tailor made for him. This is the fight that they are giving him so that he can win. Dante Mays has been just awful recently. That you, you just can't trust this guy. And they're literally giving Andre Arlovsky kind of a send-off win by giving him Dante Mays. I've even heard that even after this fight, that Andre Arlovsky might, after the win, um, just retire. And I've heard that as well. Um, so you think again that Arlovsky would be like minus 400. Dante Mays is a favorite. Okay, Dante Mays is minus 135. Um, and for a fight where everybody's on the Arlovsky side, for, Ma for Dante Mays to be a minus 135 favorite is kind of ridiculous. So we're going to we're gonna take it. We're going to lay the 135 like an idiot because everybody's on the Arlovsky side. And who on their right mind is taking Dante Mays plus the, minus the 135? So we're just going ahead and do that. So Dante Mays... Let's see. Minus the 135. Now, I would play him inside the distance. Well, should I play him inside the distance? Yeah, you know, let's take a look at that. This is going to be actually a fun one because this is the narrative I want to pursue. I want to say that Don Mays actually gets a takedowns and then a submission. So what do you get for Don Mays by submission? Plus 1,100. That's what I'm talking about. Who needs the minus 135? Let's get Dante Mays by submission plus 1,100. See what this is, by the way? This is 13 fights. This is the clear way to go 0-13. Okay, this is, I promise you, you, you follow what I'm doing here, you'll be 0-13. I shouldn't say that because after the 12th fight and the 13th fight, I'm going to give you something, hopefully, that's like 13-1. to 1, So there's always hope. All right, uh, moving on, we have John Castaneda versus Muin uh, Gafarov. And you have Gafarov, who's off of a uh, – he's taking this on short notice. 
And I'm kind of back and forth on this one because I think the public's sort of back and forth on this. You are getting a majority of the um, of the action coming on Castaneda. And part of it, again, is as part of this Daniel Santos pick. Castaneda actually took it to Daniel Santos and knocked him down. So there are really a lot of public action on the Castaneda side. So we are going to take the um, the other side of this. We're going to play the short notice replacement. We are going to uh, play against the Castaneda. I don't say hype, but his most recent performance. We're just going to take the plus 115 and be done with it. All right. I don't know how this guy's going to, whether it's going to be decision or whatever it is. So we're just going to take Gafrov plus the 115 for a 180. All right, we have maybe, what, five more fights to go, something like that, maybe six. So this is a replacement fight. We have Jamie Malarkey versus uh, Mahama, Mahama, I'm not going to bet on you, okay, whatever your name is. Uh, this is a short-notice guy who's being fed to the wolves here, and uh, I just really don't have anything, but you know the rules, right? We have to do something. So let's pick Malarkey. Uh, I'll tell you what's a little bit, uh, a little bit off the beaten path is malarkey by decision where everybody's going to boo him the whole time. And let's play that. Let's go malarkey by decision plus 200. This is the least confident I am only because I don't really see any big lean one way or the other. Okay. We're going to get to the other replacement fight in a minute where I do have an opinion. All right. Uh, Abukar Nurmagomedov versus uh, Dolesky De Santos. Um, probably about seventy-five percent of the public is on Dos Santos here, and the reason why it's kind of like a weird bit of anti-Nurmagomedov bias. So Nurmagomedov, obviously, he's the cousin of 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 the of the good Nurmagomedov, but he's being looked at as kind of like the worst of all of them. Okay. Um. But remember, just because he's the worst of all of them doesn't mean he's just like the worst. Okay. He could be pretty good and still be the worst of all of them. It's not like, you know, I have this discussion. I've had this uh, talked about with my son sometimes, my wife. Like somewhere out there, there's got to be the worst doctor, right? By process of elimination, right? And, and someone actually has an appointment to see him tomorrow. And, and, and so there certainly has to be the worst Nurmagomedov. But the thing is, nobody necessarily has to have an appointment to see him tomorrow. Like he's in the UFC. He's probably got something. But just because he's not as good as the other Nurmagomedovs doesn't mean he's terrible. So I'm going to go with that. I'm going to take Nurmagomedov plus, what is that? Actually, it's the minus 115. Um, let's do that. Nurmagomedov minus the 115. Or 180. Okay, that's eight. We do have five more. Moving on, we have, uh, where are we? Kareem Silva versus Kirsten Souza. This is a little bit weird because I'm actually hearing a little bit of, of Souza love. The, the idea being that Silva's unproven, that Silva's not as good as people think, and that she's been actually taken down before or something. I, I, I don't quite understand where all this Souza kind of steam is coming from. So we're just going to be, not the square, but we're going to take Silva. We're going to pick our favorite round. Maybe we get one of those good round two props that we used to like to play. Let's see, round props. There you go. Kareem Silva, round two, plus 450. This looks good enough for me. Where is this? Uh, round two, 450. Perfect. Rin Silva in round two or one eighty. Okay, so we have nine bets. So I think there's only four more or three more. I think. Uh, actually, there are four more. All right, Tim Elliott uh, versus Victor Altamirano. This one is just uh, it just really doesn't get any easier than this, right? So you have Tim Elliott, who this this is what you'll hear in the media. Number one, he's got the veteran savvy. And he's going to show that veteran savvy by taking it to Victor Altamirano. Second thing is that Victor Altamirano doesn't have a lot of takedown defense and Tim Elliott just go ahead and take him down. That's the easy part. 
Then you have this Tim Elliott in the news business. And I'll just, you know, I won't get into all of it, but let's just say that that 90% of the analysis of this fight has had to do with Tim Elliott like mad at, at stuff outside the ring, which means somehow that he's gonna take it out on his opponent. And and I've even heard that they're they're gonna that he's gonna win just so that he can get the mic at the end of the fight. Well. All this is good enough for me. I will take Victor Altamirano plus, what is it? What am I getting? 155? That sounds good. So Victor Altamirano plus 155 for 180. All right. So Jim Miller, who basically is, is like a legend of MMA, he has, I, I want to say, the record for knockouts or something like that or wins. He's just been around forever. And not only that, like recently, he's actually had a big resurgence. You know, he had a bunch of, of second round KOs and he's really doing it. He's actually had a pretty good, good performance against Alexander Hernandez. I mean, he did lose at the end, but he put kind of put it on him in that third round. And he had a kind of a tough fight against Jared Gordon, uh, which McCall had planned, but he was kind of viewed as kind of a live underdog in that spot. Well, Jared Gordon dropped out, and he's getting this dude named uh, Jesse Butler on literally two days' notice, okay, or three days' notice. So you'd expect, obviously, that Jim Miller would be like a minus 500 or something like that. I mean, this dude, no, nobody literally knows who he is, okay? And Jim Miller is like a legend, and he's been sharp, and his cardio has stood up. So you expect to be minus 500, He's only minus 240. Huh. Give me the butler. Let's go. I don't even know who this dude is, but I promise you this is a huge, enormous trap. Okay? There's no way that that this dude, just, just Jesse Butler's got to have something to, have only, to be only a plus 200. I mean, I think this is a joke. Uh, I don't... I've heard like rumors that maybe he has good takedown offense. I don't know. I, I've just seen this way too many times in my life. Give me the Butler plus the 200. All right. Uh, one more, two more. So you have the co-main event, I suppose. You have Alex Caceres versus Daniel Pineda. Um, I've unfortunately don't have a big lean here because I don't think the public has a big lean either. You know, Caceres, they don't really trust Caceres' most recent performances. They think that, you know, maybe he's just bought finally guys that he can beat. And Pineda, I mean, people are saying, I guess he's more of an action guy. They can get after him in, in round one, but then he might gas. So I guess the only real contrarian thing we can do is probably just bet the fight to go over or something like that. So why don't we do that? Let's how about what's, what's over two and a half in this fight. Uh, let's see. Wow. It's only one and a half. So we can get over one and a half minus one. Eight. So why don't we do an alt one? Let's do an alt. We do an alt um, over here. Let's see. Oh, we can go by, by the distance, right? Uh, let's see. Round props. Uh, hold on a minute. We, oh, fight lines. Uh, fight goes to... Oh, alt rhymes. Okay. Uh, alt 0.5. I don't want that one. There it is. Over 2.5 plus 110. Let's do that. Over 2.5 plus 110. For one. Basically, it goes to a decision, but just in case you get that late finish, we've got that. Then again, hold on. Let's just see here. Uh... Oh, to go the distance plus 140. So is it worth the extra round, you know, half a round to get an extra plus 30? Is there a chance that it finishes round three, uh, upwards of 30 cents? Yeah, you know, I'll just take the plus 110. I'll, I'll just get it to go, just in case of that late finish. Boy, it seems like I should be greedy and take the plus 140. Now, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll just take the plus 140. Okay. Um, let's go on to the main events. Um, 
Okay. I, now we're not looking at this from a from a DraftKings perspective. We're looking at it from a betting perspective. Don't quite get this one. Okay. You have Ty Car France, who has quote unquote the pedigree. He's fought main events. He actually was competitive against Brandon Moreno. Okay. Uh, he was re really doing well before he got that liver kick, uh, that liver shot to, to knock him out. And then you have Amir Albazi, who's fought nobody. Okay. Doesn't have this type of experience at all. And not only that, like Albazi's path to victory is grappling and wrestling. And Kai Kara France, from what I've heard, is legit, the, probably the has the best takedown defense in the UFC, or at least close. So not only is the is the strength of schedule in, in Kai Kara France's favor and the striking in his favor, but a, a style edge here, which is insane, that really Albazi's main weapon is going to be neutralized. So Kai Kara France is apparently supposedly a lock, and yet it's only 110. So I am going to go with Albazi here. Uh, Abazi, I I don't know how he's going to do it. You know, uh, I don't want to necessarily explain by finish because he could get the he could get a decision win if he gets like a you know a zillion takedown. So let's go do that. Let's just play. Well, let's just see here. Hold on. Am I going? If I do, I want to be greedy. Let's. We got to go backwards. Uh, and they have these fights here too. Um. All right. So you have Abazi. It's like a minus one. Actually, it's minus one twenty now. So money's come in on him. What did you get for Albazi by submission just for fun? Plus 275? Mm. By decision, plus 380? Yeah, I'm a little confused. I'm, I'm just going to take Albazi minus the one. Oh, no, I can't do that, can I? Yeah. You want to know why? Because we're going to be 0-12. So if we're going to be 0-12, I'm going to have to take something that's 13-1. to you're going to have to do it. So let's just find these round props. We're going to take Albazi in some kind of round here. Let's see. The good thing is, is all of these. Ooh. Albazi round three plus 1,200. So if I play him round three plus 1,200, I guess it's possible that this doesn't even get me out for the day. So do we, ha well, so do we have to bump this up to round four? Plus 1,600. No, you know what? That's just what they're expecting it's us to do. See, they're giving me this plus 1,600 on purpose, knowing that I'm going to go 0-12 and, and try to sucker me in to playing the plus 1,600. But no, we're not doing that. We're going to take this one. We're going we're gonna to bet that we can win one fight before here. So all we're going to need to get even is, this, is the round three. Okay. So there we go, round three. And this, this is listen. This is the type of analysis you don't get anymore. Okay, here we go, round three, plus one eighty. Oh, well, it's not even letting me look at this. Doesn't even wait. Not round two, round three. There it is, round three. Okay, so here are the rules, though. Um, I'm not going to be able to bet this until I hang up with you guys because because I'm connected to Zoom, but. This is exactly what I'm betting. I'm going to be hitting click as soon as we get rid of this. Okay. Um, so let's just kind of review these atrocious bets we're making. Philip wins by decision. Are you kidding me? I mean, who's doing this? Grisham has the, the, the striking edge, right? He's the one that's going to win this point fighting battle. The only way Linz is going to win is kind of like by finish. So who's betting this? Well, we are. Demond Blackshear by, sub, by submission? Do you see what was going on with this dude against against Farid Basharat? He was getting destroyed up uh, from up top. There's no way. Well, we're gonna find out. Well, Elise Reed. I mean, if if twenty out of twenty touts are giving me Elise Reed, I mean, how can that not win? Well, we'll find out. Jin Yu Free plus one ten. Uh, Willie Cat Santos. You got the nickname. You got the recency bias. He's the flashy guy. The guys they want to win. Johnny Munoz low volume. Well, good enough for me. Plus 185. Dante Mays is going to win, not only going to win the fixed fight against Andre Orlovsky, where they're going to give it to him, but we're going to play that he gets the takedown and a submission. How about them apples? Plus 1,100. 
We have Gaffroth against Castaneda. This is not that big of a deal. Plus the 115. I just think that a few more people are on Castaneda than there should be. Malarkey win by decision. Again, not the not the greatest bet in the world, but we're going to do it anyway, plus 200. Nurmagomedov, minus 115. Let's take the black sheep of the Nurmagomedov family, which no one's going to take. Kareem Silva, round two. We're going to fight this steam that's coming in on the other side here. Take the plus 450 in round two. Victor Altamirano, oh my God, poor Tim Elliott. Not only does he's going to hit, Tim Elliott has the veteran savvy. He's got the style matchup. He's got the motivation. What he's not going to get is the victory. Altamirano plus the 155. The Butler did it at plus 200. Enough said. Uh, Pineda Caceres over two and a half because there's nothing else to do. And then when all of those lose, we have Armiro Albazi fighting off the world-class takedown defense of Kai Kara France, plus 1,200. Let's go. Uh, all right. Good luck, everybody. Uh, I apologize in advance for all the losses you're going to endure, but rest assured that at least you're on the, the right side of this and not the, pseudo, the super square side.